Hello everybody, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Now, this week's local history story could be considered slightly cheating because it's not technically a Dundee story, it's an Angus story. But it's a good one and it's one that you don't hear very often these days, so I thought I would give it an outing. And the main part of this story takes place at Balmachy, which is just south of Carnoustie. And there's still a farm by the name of Balmachy today in that area, which gives you an idea where this took place. But uh, part of the action also takes place at Carlungi, which is between Dundee and Angus. And one of the interesting features of Carlungi is that there's a souterrain there. And souterrains are one of the interesting sort of archaeological things you find around Angus. And if you've not come across one before, then these are underground chambers dug into the earth. And they're usually lined with stone slabs to keep them up and stop them from collapsing. Some of them would use wood instead. Uh, but most of the Angus souterrains come from the Iron Age. So this is from around 800 BC to around 100 AD. And sometimes in old documents talking about them, you see them called earth houses or Picts houses. Now, they were never actually used as houses, or to the best of our knowledge. Uh, it seems more likely that they were used for storage because they're usually found near the evidence of settlements from a similar period. But uh, people coming across them in later centuries were fascinated by them and because they were so mysterious then you often get supernatural legends becoming attached to them. And that's what's happened in this story which uh, is all about the Laird of Balmachy and his wife. And one morning the Laird of Balmachy and his wife were woken up as normal by their cockerel crowing outside. But as soon as they woke up the Laird's wife said she was feeling terrible, she was feeling really tired and ill. But she said, look, you go off to Dundee as you were going to do and I'll be fine, I'll stay here. So the Laird on his way out, he asked their servant to keep an eye on his wife that day and make sure she was alright. But apart from that, he didn't really think any more about the matter until he was coming back from Dundee that evening. And as the Laird rode north on his horse on the road to Carnoustie, the twilight was gathering. And as he approached Carlungi, where the Souterrain lies among the hillsides there, he was absolutely astounded to see a procession of tiny fairy folk come and cross the road in front of him. And he noticed that between them, they were carrying a sort of stretcher. And wrapped up in blankets on that stretcher was something that looked suspiciously like a human body. And the Laird froze in his tracks and he watched them for a while. And he was pretty terrified, but he remembered his granny's old stories. And she always used to say it's iron that defeats the fairy folk. So he rode up to them and he drew his sword. And he laid the sword down across the top of the stretcher. And he said, in the name of God, let your captive go. Now, as Granny was right, Iden does always scare off the fairies, so they laid the stretcher down on the ground and scurried away back into the hills, into the souterrain where they lived. And the laird got down from his horse and he unwrapped the body on the stretcher. And he was absolutely horrified to see that it was his own wife. But he could tell she was still living, she was breathing. So he wrapped her up again to keep her warm and he balanced her in front of him on the horse and he rode back to Balmachy. 
Now, the Laird had a feeling that this probably wasn't over and it might not be safe to bring his wife back into their own home just yet. So he stopped off at a neighbour and asked if they could look after her for a while. And off he went back to the house. And as soon as he got in up the stairs, he went to the bedroom. And sure enough, the figure that was lying in the bed, he would have sworn that it was his own wife. She looked identical in every detail. But he knew it wasn't. He kept up the pretense, though. He didn't let the fairy substitute know that the game was up. And he said, oh, dear wife, how are you feeling today? Oh, I still feel terrible, she said. I've hardly been attended to all day and the bed is so cold. Oh, that'll never do at all, said the laird. I'll tell you what, if you get up for a second, we'll make the bed up again with warmer blankets for you. Oh, I can't stand, she complained. But the laird said, well, that's all right, I'll carry you. And he hoisted the fairy substitute out of the bed, despite her protesting. And he steered her over to the fireplace where there was an armchair and he made as if to set her down in the chair. But at the last minute he thrust the fairy wife into the flames. Now because she was a fairy she could not burn and instead she bounced right off the flames in the fireplace and she went shooting out right through the roof and she went flying up into the sky and the laird stood and he looked up through this hole in the roof until he was satisfied that she was not going to return and it was only after that that he thought it was probably safe to go back to the very confused neighbour's house uh, where his even more confused wife had now woken up at the very moment that the fairy wife had been thrust into the flames. And she said that the last memory she had was of lying in bed ill that morning and seeing this host of little folk come in through the window. But after that, her mind was a blank until she'd woken up a few moments ago. And after that, the wee folk never came back to bother the Laird of Balmachie again. But there was one thing that always reminded them of that time. For every year, on the anniversary of the day the fairies came, a stormy wind would come up and it would blow the slates off that hole in the roof, no matter how well they had it fixed. 